Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now is presidential candidate of the African Action Congress and founder of the online news agency, Sahara Reporters, Omoya Leshawole. Good morning. Welcome Thank to the you. morning show. Thank you for bringing me back. <laughs> 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 we survived your third time yeah, on this podcast. That's, that's a yes, yeah, yes. We just had you a few uh, months ago yeah. and you had your um, running mate with you. No, it was, no, uh, it was his uh, campaign you, manager. Your campaign yeah, manager. Yes. Okay, that's right. All right, so but since then you have not, um, I don't know if you've released your manifesto so far? We have. Uh, yes. Okay, so can you we, tell we us? We have a manifesto, that? and our manifesto is, uh, is the Spice That Eats, uh, which is the 10 programs that we're bringing to uh, Nigeria, starting from next year, uh, that will solve a lot of the problems that you have been talking about on the show. Uh, it starts with security. Power that's energy and the infrastructure and the corruption and the economy that's all inclusive uh, with new restructuring, health, education, and the culture and forest. Spice that. Are you, are they, are you focusing on them on that on the other side? And no, not in any particular order, but uh, you know, we, we, we are trying to be creative about it so that people can understand it at all. That's why, you know, we call it Spice up, and then eat so that. People don't understand that we're eating up the system has to dissolve a lot of our problems. When you look at these issues, they are not any different from what other candidates are pushing out. But you have repeatedly, uh, you, 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 you condemned the a policy document mm -hmm. of the of Progressive Congress, you condemned that of the PDP, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah, bringing up the same issues. No, that's not true. Uh, so what's, what's For example, difference? in the area of power, we're depressed to discuss using renewable energy as a means of uh, providing in Nigeria, and we said our programs are specific. As you know, the APC and the PDP, the navigation that they even copied their manifesto from other people. We are the first to talk about a minimum wage that is specific, you know, that is bring about a minimum wage that is legitimately a living wage in our view. And we saw that uh, three days ago, South Africa stole that idea from us. Oh, right. That's just for me. <laughs> Uh, in their own interest. And they are increased their own minimum wage 30% across board. This is not just for federal workers in South Africa, no, but everyone in South Africa who is in labor uh, in the workforce is entitled to be paid an equivalent of 126,800 naira. That's the equivalent. We're still struggling to pay 30,000 uh, naira per month. Uh, so, what it does to us is that a professor that is earning 450,000 naira. Per month, it's going to take two years because before we can earn 0.7 million naira per month. Well, I know it's fashionable to yeah. say South Africa has done this, mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria has not done the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but fixing the uh, minimum wage, is it not something you do relative to your national revenue profile? It is. Uh, Revenue but to your own you, circumstances. Doc, South Africa is Africa's most industrialized economy. I, you know, Will it be correct to just say I really for emotional reasons that no, no Nigeria I, should I actually appreciate that you said that. that. But all of us in the media, you know, maybe excluding myself, celebrated when we said Nigerian economy is bigger than that of South Africa so three years ago. That was when they we calibrated and based Nigerian economy. We celebrated it everywhere. We are not bigger than South Africa. So when it is time to say we are bigger than South Africa as an economy, mm -hmm. we celebrate it. When we say do the responsibility of your size, we start saying that South Africa is bigger than us. No, it's not true. Our economy is $500 billion economy, GDP, right? Minimum wage that we are proposing is just $1.5 billion of that amount. That's what we intend to pay to workers. You know, but here is what we keep making as an argument. Let's stop deceiving ourselves. You cannot propel the Nigerian economy to the greatest height, not the next level, if you pay peanuts to your workers. You know, it makes them susceptible to corruption, it makes you know, it kills their morale. And you know, if you are in a shoe state or your state, for example, you're sending your daughter or your son mm -hmm. to school to the university there, that is the Lago Piacintola University of Technology, 
and you're asked to pay two hundred and fifty thousand dollars as school fees, where do you get the money from? So how, how come we don't talk about that? You know, the consequence of sending children to school, obtaining health, you know, and living a life that that is comfortable. That is what minimum wage. That's why we are not talking about minimum wage for a living wage for Nigeria. But let's even go beyond that and look at what our political office holders are receiving as, you know, emolument, salary, allowances, unpossible. So when you start to talk about workers, we start applying economic, emotional arguments. We start saying South Africa is bigger than us. But when it comes to talking about our leaders, our political operators, and how much they earn and how much they make. Nobody's talking about inflation. When the senator is taking home 14 million naira a month, which, by the way, is the minimum wage of a worker earning 18,000 naira over 37 years. So if you work for 38 years, I mean, between the day you start work at 18,000 naira and you retire, you are not going to receive enough money as a salary of, I mean, as the allowance of a senator who is taking home 14 million naira per month. That is per month. So let's be realistic about it. We have to stop, you know, serving the greedy. It's time to start, you know, yeah, plan Let's talk about renewable energy. energy. Yes. There are two gentlemen there yesterday yes. who came onto the program to talk about renewable energy. Yes. And one of the things we observe, uh, whether you are doing solar energy or you are doing wind energy or you are even using the hydro, yes. that there is the issue of cost. Yeah. There are many uncertainties. Whereas there is potential, you know, uh, it's still a very gray area uh, for Nigerians. So, if you become president, it will it not be better for you to do more about the existing templates, you know, which the Jenkos and Tiscos complain about, no, rather no. than say, oh, the Nigeria will do renewable energy no, 100%. No, we're not doing 100%. So it's going to be a mix. We've always said that. We also have gas. You know, there are nine billion cubic feet of gas. In that can be tapped into to also generate electricity. But there is also potential for us to generate 4,500 megawatts of electricity out of northern Nigeria because of you know, the preponderance of sunshine in that part of the world. There's also possibility for us to expand our hydroelectric generation capacity. There's possibility for biogas if we use the droppings of cows if we go into commercial ranching, for instance. And we keep all our 20 million cows in ranches across the country, or not necessarily across the country, whatever we can afford to place them. The droppings is going to get generated over 1,000 megawatts of electricity. We're just thinking progressively. It's not expensive. And one other thing we need to do is to break down this begging called the national grid. It's obsolete, it's no longer working for us, and have isolated mini grids across the country. So if you are generating from Kano, you supply Kano first. And everybody can also get into the business of selling electricity. Electricity that comes from, say, solar, don't have to come from government alone. You can have your roof plastered with solar energy panels, and you can sell it to, uh, to, to a jet, uh, for example, or a disco, whichever way they are described. But currently, our system has broken down in terms of electricity. There is no way we can continue with this miserable 3,000 megawatts of electricity that the Jenkos and Discos are managing. And there's no way we can continue with our broken transmission system that is not taking us anywhere. So I don't even want to discuss what we have currently. It's not sufficient, mm -hmm. it's not going to serve the purpose we need, and we cannot use that to create a new economy that we're talking about, that will generate over five million jobs that we'll be talking about, that will bring about prosperity in this country, and that will make us competitive, even in the African sub-region. Uh, or sub saharan African uh, region. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Morocco, for example. Morocco is about selling electricity to Malta and France. Right? The same thing is happening in Tunisia. Egypt just increased the electrical, uh, electricity generation to 17,000. Over mm -hmm. two and a half years, 17,000 megawatts. So what is wrong with us here is because we don't have leaders who understand how these things work. They have uh, become obsolete in their thinking. They don't know how to operate things. And beyond that, corruption has destroyed this country to the point that we once spent $16 billion to generate electricity. Well, not generate electricity, but darkness. That is what happened with uh, uh, the PDP in the last uh, 16 years. So uh, I'm not discussing that. We're discussing things that are possible in the future. And that's why we're here.
Yes, what kind of security architecture do you have in mind? Uh, because most of your comments on security, said that I've heard you say, oh, all the service chiefs should be fired Absolutely. and all of that. Yes. You know, is it really about personnel it's, it's, or it's, about the, the framework, the architecture? It's, no, it's, it's personnel, it's leadership as well. So two things are happening in Nigeria. We're spending too much of our time using soldiers to carry back for my dams. You know, that's how to break it down in a simple way. We need our police. Soldiers. Yes, soldiers are doing... Carrying their, bags. Yeah, they're, mm -hmm. they're carrying bags. No, I haven't seen that. I don't well, think I've seen that know, either. You should read Sahara Brothers more. I'm okay. not promoting it. Uh, but we have photographs of soldiers, policemen carrying bags. Yeah, I know about policemen. Yeah, soldiers are doing it too. Soldiers are doing jobs that they're not supposed to do. They're supposed to focus and concentrate on protecting the territory and the of Nigeria. Why we strengthen our police to do internal security? We now even have uh, the civil defense force camp. So there should be enough so that our soldiers can concentrate fully on fighting the terrorists. The reason I said I want to fire uh, army generals is that you know Boko Haram has become an industrial complex. People are making money off of it. How so? Oh yes, uh, you know I covered Boko Haram for over since it started, and I knew that if they wanted to end Boko Haram, it would have ended by now. There was even a BBC report, uh, which is not from a Nigerian uh, newspaper, that said. Shekau, who was lead, who was leader of one of the faction, was almost getting killed. And they, they got a call from Abuja to stand down. Uh, the special unit that was fighting on them, uh, 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 at that time. In terms of personnel, the Nigerian army don't have enough commanders. There are only five thousand commanders commanding over one. I mean, three hundred thousand soldiers. Because the senior army officers in the country don't want the promotion to happen to people below them. So to keep themselves in their permanent positions where they make a lot of money and make, uh, you know deals, they keep just a few officers, and as a result, people are exposed to danger. They're getting killed. I think I was on a show about a month ago where I said that our soldiers are just being led to slaughter. And some, you know, the moment I got out of the show, the, the APC people on Twitter started condemning what I said. Then a few weeks later, look at what happened to our soldiers. You know, these guys have been exposed. There's no way in the world where you are fighting the kind of insurgency we're fighting, and you put people in open bands inside deserts to be roaming around. It's, it's like leading people to their slaughter. In other countries, in Sena times, what do you do? You put them in armored personnel carrier. What happened to them? The soldiers themselves are making you know, videos saying that they are using T-72 tanks that were bought in 1983. Are we, are we living in the past? Listen, what I'll say that's most important though is that apart from just uh, recalibrating and reordering the leadership of the military, we have to fire the commander in chief of the armed forces, the one that is there now. Okay, but well, tell us how, in specific terms, uh, people are making money out of Boko Haram. Oh, you know. You just made a statement. Uh, yes, so. To clarify it. Thank you very much. So, you know, I used to be an investigative reporter yeah. before I came to this, and I did most of the investigative reports that led to the arrest of several um, um, military officers, uh, the Navy, the Air Force when Buhari came into office. And then they set up their own investigation in the, in, in the government. And the moment that investigation was going in the direction of some of their serving political office holders, uh, or army generals, they shut it down. I mentioned at that time that Dambazo was indicted, but they didn't allow the indictment to take place because he was a member of the party. Even the current chief of army staff, we had reports showing that he had homes in Dubai that he bought when he was part of the procurement of military hardware. This evidence was presented. They were making payments to the bank for the homes in Dubai. An army colonel was being sent to the bank to pay regularly to first group, which was later quietly shut down. That's the problem. Usually, if you go to Abuja hotels, the people that you find a group of first group, they, you know, they stand around in the lobby asking you to buy houses in Dubai. Sometimes it's not full properties, you know, it's to buy a fraction of properties uh, in Dubai, you know, they, they eventually shut them down quietly so that they cover up all of this. They continued with that. These are not something that happened in the past. These are things that continued into this current government. Sure, I, I wanted to say finally, also, not finally, but one of it is how they do deals with some of the girls that were rescued. You need to know the amount of money that were bought how in much? jails. Well, it was about 5 million euros at a time for a set. As a matter of fact, we heard at that time, uh, part of our investigation, that Boko Haram wanted to release all the girls at once 
but they told them to hold on because it's a business for us. Let's be doing it gradually. When they got some girls from that shit, they got a lot of money too. So it got to a point that you're wondering why is it that they just don't allow Boko Haram to have an embassy in Abuja so that we know that they are legitimately a government is controlling part of our territory. Okay, let's talk a bit about your campaign. Yes. About a week ago, you started this 100 city tour. Yes. I don't know whether you can cover 100 cities uh, within the short time uh, you have left before the election. But you went to Daura. Yes. The home of the uh, President, President Buhari. Yes. President Buhari. Yes. Um, what did you see there? How was the reception? It was, it was, it was the I, I, I had some of them were calling you a... Uh, Save our box. Save, yes. Okay. Yes. Save uh, so, when we were we were actually on our way to Casina, uh, which is the capital of uh, Casina, says it's homestead, and we, we got we, we got to Dara, and it was night, so we we're hoping that we can just pass through the place mm -hmm. to find out that people were waiting for us, you know, and we followed them and we we're, were shocked. First, we we're shocked that the place was dark, no electricity in Buhari's hometown. And then, well, why should there be electricity there when there is no electricity well, in other parts of Nigeria? Well, we, we, we found that to be surprising because we had thought that as president of Nigeria, at least, you know, as they say, charity begins at home, you know. If they are showcasing that they, they have uh, achieved a few things, uh, including improvement in electricity, you would like to see it in the home of the president. He doesn't live in the jungle. But let's move on. Uh, we got there only to find a lot of young people saying, Man, we, we love you to why did you come in the night? We'd have loved to take you around Taipa. They promised to take us to in front of his house to remind him that he's coming back home. They don't want him to continue as president of Nigeria. And then we went around and it turns out that the people of Dara are complaining as about Buhari as much as the people of Abonema, uh in Potako, because that's where that you can go in Nigeria. They are tired of President Buhari. They, in fact, I don't know if they wanted to come back home because for a lot of them, it was a disgrace. One of the kids was saying to us on, on tape that Buhari is finished. Buhari is finished. That was in his hometown. We were surprised at the reception because typically uh, we thought maybe there could be some hostility and it was nice. It wasn't so. And this was live. We taped it live as we were rolling through through the town. And as we approached the, uh, the exit of uh, the town, these kids follow us. I mean, young people mostly. And that was how they started the Save of War, and which is an opposite of Save Baba, you know. I think they're tired of all the Babas and they're asking that, you know, uh, we continue the life young, of the country uh, on the yeah, young uh, on the, on the, on the let black, ask, young white person. Let me ask you two qu questions. Uh, one taking back to security. Josh yesterday described the Nigerian police force as an occupation force for the ruling of Progressive Congress. Yeah. Are you worried that the police is not neutral going into this election? That's my first question to you. Yeah. Secondly, let me ask you about funding of election campaigns in Nigeria. We've heard presidential ask, uh, candidates on this show saying that they feel disadvantaged already because they do not have the resources the major parties have. Mm -hmm. However, they say they don't need so much funds to pass their message to Nigerians. You are doing a crowdfunding yes. uh, for the $2 funding. million. Dollar, what happens if you don't reach down that? Would you resort to those you so much reprove as Godfathers? Yeah. Uh, so the first question about the police, I was quite uh, appalled at what the police did yesterday uh, to the giant Adeonju who was protesting uh, against police uh, uh, seeming lack of neutrality in the election. And when I read the press release of the police, I found out that they're charging the city for you know, all kinds of very nebulous Crimes. I couldn't believe it. In fact, they said at the end of uh, their press release that they presented evidence of, you know, what I thought would be weapons, and it turns out they were Facebook posts and black, you know, posters to say that you know the police should be neutral. It's very, very investigated that a Nigerian police got to that, and you could tell that they have become they found themselves in a defensive state because since yesterday they have been issuing releases to defend why they did this ridiculous thing. I was a student activist in the nineties. And even in the 90s, this would be ridiculous on that military road that police would arrest somebody for protesting. For well, expressing you know, an opinion. Uh, an opinion. And I do that all the time. And what you are saying is that they are just using the G, and they are not the rest of them as social experimentation for what they will do to candidates that are critical of the government or even political interests of parties. So we must all condemn this. Uh, and it should not be allowed 
this is they have, they have stepped over their bounds and we must condemn it. Uh, I go to crowdfunding, uh, which is what we're doing. We've reached a hundred thousand naira. I'm sorry, dollars. Uh, now out of uh, two million dollars that we said we, we want or we want to raise, and this is a way of getting Nigerians to own the electoral process or the campaign process, because otherwise politicians just save money in bags and distribute to people. They save Ankara, distribute to people. Uh, they distribute rice uh, that are branded. But in this case, we're getting people interested and excited and energized to say, look, you know, if you put your money in political process, you support the candidate, you're likely to be more interested in what happens uh, to this candidate and how they're running their campaign. And it brings about political participation at a level that they never seen before. So, but in order to save ourselves the embarrassment of money short of the, the money we need, we also open a Nigerian account. Uh, then a bank account. Well, we raised over 35 million naira almost now. People are donating. Wow. Yes. That's interesting. Yes. So we are close to 100 million naira. Uh, we're about 72 million naira now. And people are making donations. And every night, we also announce for people who want their names to be announced. How much they donate? Well, I hope you are aware that the EFCC is saying that look, all of these monies, contributions, yeah. should be reported to yeah. the last detail. Yes. And the spending, the disbursement, should be reported. Yeah, I so hope you are keeping records. We, have, we keep records. But we hope that the EFCC is also tracking records of the spending by the APC. We heard the other day that uh, the Kano State of no, Kandola uh, also contributed. No, it's, it's we contributed to Kandola. I just came from Kano. They changed his name to Kandola. Because of the way he was collecting dollars <laughs> in the, uh, uh, Bavarica. So they call him Kandola. Kandola. In case, in case okay. you haven't heard about it, yeah, that's, that that's his new nickname, okay. uh, Kandola. So he donated 10 million naira to the EFC. Although the EFC denied it, but they haven't denied it convincingly. Uh, okay. Yes, in a way. But we have also found governors to use state resources to donate buses to the Buhari uh, campaign. And all these buses are available. We don't have to worry about it, but we are just saying that those who are you know, coming to equity uh, must come with clean hands. And that applies also to the People's Democratic Party. We must explain in detail how they got the money in Kotakot to bribe all the delegates that voted for article. So we hope every, everybody is keeping record and EFCC will do a great job of making sure that they're impartial so that they don't turn themselves into the Nigerian police with their despicable acts of uh, yesterday. Although you really didn't answer my question, I said if you run short of the money you need, yeah, you well, so, so, so running short of money mm -hmm. is not the same thing as running short of support. Right? The way to break it down is that apart from the cash, people are also making kind of issues. They are donating the apartments, cars for branding for us. Uh, people are taking over. We have a process where individuals can also support world chairmen, uh, campaigners, and uh, people who are campaigners directly without getting through us. We had someone, for example, who donated over 15 megaphones to us from New York, who just brought them yesterday. And these are ways through which you can, you can support. But we hope that more Nigerians will come out because we need about 400 million naira. And you have about 100 million now? No, at this point, 70. 70 million, 70 million uh, okay. uh, Naira has been raised creatively. And this has been done transparently, uh, transparently as well. So ESCC can also go to uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, I'll go fund me a campaign. And also contribute. And then can I, <laughs> perhaps we don't need ESCC uh, contribution at, at this point. Since they didn't just that, take that would be a breaking news. Yes. And just a hard well, carry that as no, well. If ESCC contributes to my campaign, I'll be entitled to it since they started. Right. I think uh, Sahara Brothers have supported the ESCC the most. So, but we won't take it as an issue. If, if they are members, they are respective officers, okay, that's not to contribute. They are free to do so. For yeah, I'm sure they are listening to you. Yeah, I'm sure. And they're, not, they're not far from here. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, what's that your name? Save Save all. All. Save all. All. It's thank always you. a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Thanks, Thanks for being here. It's time now for a short break on the morning show. When we return, our Rise News analyst Emmanuel Ibeni will join us to review some of the top stories on today's newspapers. Stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you want to take a picture? I hope so. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't bring my high heels. <laughs> I can take my shoes off. <laughs>
No, wait, wait, let me also stand. Are they sure? Come on. Are they sure? Everybody can just sit. Everybody can just sit. Okay. 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 Oh, all right. Okay. Please go sit down. Please go sit down. Okay. Great. Stop down. Come on. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just about to smile. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.